spend a little time today talking about the nature of racial profiling and in particular the effect of racial profiling on 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 people and this was the substance of my testimony in the Luamba case and so I put together a few slides to aid me over the next 20 minutes in laying that out. Um, I should acknowledge that uh, I am joining you from uh, Mi'kma'ki, uh, Chibuktuk in Mi'kma'ki, uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia. Uh, this is the traditional and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Of course, is home to the Mi'kmaq, Wallastagwiak peoples, and many other First Nations, and many other peoples today. And this is a um, a piece of art representing our presence here in in, in Turtle Island, and um, a, 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 a Indigenous artist by the name of Patrick Hunter um, uh, gave me permission to use this in my in my. Uh, presentations. It represents our living on Turtle Island, the many uh, lakes, the fertile land, the seven grandfather teachings, and, uh, and of course, uh, our presence there represented by the, the teepee in the center of the island. I always say that when I do presentations that we need to understand that a land acknowledgement is particularly um, essential when we do this kind of work, we, because we need to remember that racism is North America's original sin and that um, it is the source of many of the tensions, most of the tensions that we experience today, even if we think about the economic tensions, uh, given the nature of the foundation of North American um, economy. Um, the economy, our society was based on two major offenses, and that being the attempted genocide of First Nations and the enslavement of people of African descent. And so land acknowledgments and other acts of reconciliation are more than just uh, trite gestures. They are deep acknowledgments of that history. And of course, the need for reconciliation with Indigenous peoples, if we are ever going to find a way to live peacefully and sustainably in this land. I've already been introduced, so I will forego this slide, but I think that uh, to frame up my comments, we need to ask the question, is racial profiling harmful? And uh, I think that it's often the case when policing agencies are, are, are asked to defend these practices, the line has often be, been that um, pulling people over stopping people and asking them for ID, uh, even stopping people who are on foot, that these are minor interventions into, in a person's life and that they are at best benign um, uh, interactions with little lasting impact on the citizens that are stopped. This characterization, however, poorly understands the history of, and and the nature of racial uh, trauma experienced by people of African descent. In fact, I would say not just people of African descent, but racialized people in North America more generally. And, and so my uh, premise is that each encounter with the police, however benign, is a deep and troubling trigger that adds to the burden carried by people of African descent. And there's been much, much, uh, uh, a study about racism's harmful health effects on populations. Uh, all stress-related diseases are uh, more present and uh, more um, destructive in Black bodies, um, and that the research demonstrates that even encountering things like poverty and diet and help-seeking behaviors and a whole other host of things that can affect one's health race and racism continues to be identified as a major contributor to the, the illnesses, particularly the stress-related illnesses that Black people suffer. Um, I should say that in this presentation, I'll be talking a lot about people of African descent, Black people. I could extend that to say people who are racialized and Indigenous in Canada. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> to understand this a little better, we need to ask the question, what is trauma? And trauma, I think, is, has entered the kind of the, the popular discourse now, much like mental health concepts like depression and anxiety. These are household words. Trauma, though, is a type of psychological injury that we suffer when confronted either with a dramatically threatening stimulus that overwhelms our ability to cope, or when we are dealing with a chronic uh, um, stimulus that agitates us um, in a prolonged kind of manner. So the kind of stress that can relate to trauma can be acute or chronic. It can be severe or minor, but enduring. The tr we often use the term trauma colloqu colloquially to refer both to the event and the particular response to the event. So we might say that a car accident was a trauma, but really the psychological consequences of the car accident is actually a trauma. Now I'm going to try to um, use this whiteboard and use my mouse as a pen to uh, give you an under, uh, a graphic kind of representation of how trauma works. I do this almost every time I'm working with a client or teaching the concept. So bear with me as I try to do it here. That is a very poorly drawn brain. It is made to look a little more like a brain when I draw a head around it. <laughs> and then I will represent our five senses here. So I always say this is the way the brain is supposed to work. The brain is supposed to work this way. Stuff happens outside of us. We take it inside of us through our senses. And then we process that event and the sensory data in two main parts of the brain what I'll call the thinking place and the feeling place. No need to get detailed in terms of the uh, psychology. So it's very simple. Stuff happens outside of us. We take it in through our senses. We think about it. We feel about it. And then we take that experience and we file it away. So I'll just make a little filing cabinet here. And this is where all of the working data is kept in our brains we are able then to uh, function based on uh, every new experience being able to be referenced with our previous experiences, and we are able to function in an organized fashion. Um, um, so we're constantly processing our experiences, our sensory data, our thoughts, or what meaning we make out of it, and the feelings we attach to it, and then we file that in our brain and that allows us to make decisions as we go through the day. A trauma then is something that happens outside of us that as it happens to us is either so bizarre or so threatening that as we take it in through our senses, it overwhelms our ability to think and make sense of it. It overwhelms our capacity to feel and organize our affect around it. And as a result of not being able to make sense of it, we cannot file that experience in our filing cabinet. So a layman's way of understanding trauma then is to understand that the brain takes those experiences and puts them in a place in our brain that is not an organized location from which we can draw information later on and contribute to our functioning and, and our growth and learning, but rather it, it is kept in an area of our brain that is only designed to take that information and contain it so that we can uh, get on with our day not having to be troubled in every moment of the day by our trauma. So I always say, if we think about the difference between the filing cabinet and this junk drawer in the brain, we can, most of us think about our kitchens. 
And when we open the flatware drawer in our kitchen, we have everything organized. We have a, the knives, the little spoons, the big spoons, the little forks, the big forks, et cetera, et cetera. And then all of us in our kitchen also have a junk drawer where we throw things that don't have any place and we can never find anything in there. We go looking for a wrench, we'll find a screwdriver. We go looking for the tape, we'll find the glue. We go looking for batteries. There's always batteries there, but they never work. So that's how trauma works in our brain. And so if we understand that the trauma gets put in our brain through our sensory inputs, then we can understand, your, understand what we often call a trigger. So a trigger is something that happens to us. Maybe I'll just change the color of that so we can see it for contrast. Something that happens outside of us that as we take it in through our senses is so reminiscent of our trauma that rather than our ability to process this new circumstance, instead of processing it with thoughts and feelings, because it is so reminiscent of our trauma, the event seems to circumvent our thinking and feeling, and it activates our trauma junk drawer. And then we find ourselves responding and reacting out of the trauma. And so our behavior, our thoughts, our words, our physical uh, responses to this event is not proportionate to the trigger, but is resonant and responsive to the, the trauma with which it is resonant. So my example of this is, and I'll, uh, my apologies for being so detailed in this description, but it's important to understand the nature of these interactions, is that if a person is driving down the highway and it's wintertime, and the snow is, it, it's snowing lightly, and they hit a patch of ice, and they feel their car's fishtail, and then the car flips over and lands in the ditch dramatically, and there's uh, fire trucks and police, uh, tr police officers and people scrambling to help them, and they get out of the vehicle, and they get put in an ambulance, and they get sent to, to a hospital. In telling that story, the person might have a memory that goes something like this. I was driving down the highway, I felt my car fishtail, and the next thing I remember, I was in an ambulance going to the hospital. It's almost like the dramatic and traumatic aspect of that memory is slightly beyond the reach of their memory. That's because it's not in the filing cabinet, it's in the junk drawer. Now, Fast forward a couple of years, a person is driving down that same road and there's a light snow and they feel their car start to fishtail. And automatically they feel the same rush of panic. They feel the same fear. They, see, they feel the same kind of uh, uh, threat against their life that they experienced during their original accident, and they may be so upset by that fishtailing that they have to pull over on the side of the road and catch their breath. In an extreme case, they may not be able to continue to drive and may need to call for help to have a family member come to drive them back home. Why? Because the trauma that they experienced was activated by a trigger in the contemporary circumstance. Okay. So if we understand that, then we can, we can start to see, oops, let me just, uh, I just have to go back to my annotations and clear that. <clears throat> So if we understand that, then we can start to understand how trauma 
that is activated by these uh, tr benign traffic stops makes these benign traffic stops less than benign. We also need to think about the concept of intergenerational trauma, which is simply the idea that trauma can be passed down from trauma survivors to their descendants. We sometimes call this transgenerational or multi-generational trauma, and, and I think that we Indigenous Canadians have helped us to better understand this with um, an articulation of the intergenerational trauma experienced by, uh, by the survivors of residential schools and their, um, their descendants. Uh, in the Black community, we talk about a particular type of intergenerational trauma that Joy DeGruy articulated as post-traumatic slave syndrome. Um, uh, when we come to racial profiling, then we can, we can think about what it is. It's already been defined for us, this differential treatment based on a perception of our race. Uh, it has many faces. And it is linked to the history of racism that uh, racialized people have experienced in North America. Um, just to understand the legal foundations of modern racism, I always like to take people back to the middle of the 15th century. We need to remember that the Christian nations of Europe at that time were fighting the Crusades rather unsuccessfully. Depending upon who you read, the Crusades had been wars that were raging for four or 500 years. And part of the reason why the European Christian nations were not successful in achieving an absolute conquering in the, the Crusades was because the nature of the legal, the legality of warfare limited their capacity to have the kind of absolute victory that they were, they were needing or felt that they needed. So with each skirmish, with each conflict, the uh, Christian nations of Europe would send their armies down to clear the um, Saracens and Muslim um, nations who had um, taken over their, colon their colonies of, in the Holy Land, and the Christian nations would come back and they would use their armies to push back the armies of, of the, the Muslim nations. And having had victory in warfare, they would think that they, would, they could then secure the, the, the land, that the treaties that they had signed would be respected, and they'd take their armies home. But of course, having different ideas of uh, ownership of land and the nature of warfare, the Muslim armies would come back and reclaim the Holy Lands. And so this battle went on for several hundred years until in the middle of the 15th century, uh, popes began to uh, write a series of papal bulls that were essentially changing the legal foundation of warfare. And instead of warfare being one army meeting another army in the field, one army defeating another army and leaders entering into, uh, into treaties that would establish how we would then conduct ourselves thereafter. Uh, these papal bulls allowed for the absolute vanquishing of peoples, in particular non-Christian peoples. So this one papal bull called Dum Diversas allowed the king of Portugal to inv invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans and other enemies of Christ, to dispossess them of any kingdoms, dukedoms, principalities, dominions, to reduce their persons to per perpetual slavery, to apply and appropriate to himself and to his successors the kingdoms, dukedoms, possessions, goods. In other words, the, 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 the kid gloves are off and we are going to subdue and uh, not only the nations, but the very bodies of these individuals that we, we uh, encounter in the battlefield. In fact, Dum Diversas permitted the European Christian nations to reduce the bodies of 
of their enemies into perpetual enslavement, uh, which is the first time that that kind of slavery existed, this slavery in perpetuity. So that Dum Diversas built the foundation of what we call the doctrine of discovery, which was international law that gave license to explorers to claim vacant land in the name of their sovereign. Okay? And vacant land would be defined as land that was not populated by Christians. So now after the middle of the 15th century, as European explorers went about the globe, they were not just explorers anymore, they were conquerors and colonizers. They would, they would land on a piece of land. They only had to ask the current occupants of that land one question, are you a Christian? And if the answer came back, no, then uh, the, the explorer could then declare all, of, all that they saw in the name of their particular sovereign and then proceed to either kill, capture or enslave all of the occupants of the land. And European explorers after the 15th century did that with great efficiency all over the globe. Now, it's important to understand that the doctrine of discovery is alive and well today. And I have a couple of slides here that aren't showing up very well. I had some pictures here. Um, essentially, let me suggest that the doctrine of discovery um, let me see if I can see this in other, in other places. Um, the doctrine of discovery, for example, uh, um, is the rationale that the Canadian government makes when uh, in conflict with Indigenous people about things like um, uh, pipelines. The federal government claims it has the right to put a pipeline over this land. Indigenous people say it's actually our land and we did not give up the right to it. And often in the discourse in these places, you'll hear uh, references to the fact that when the land was taken, <laughs> uh, it was legal to have been to, to do so, that the federal government is within its right to assert its authority over the land because of the nature of the colonization. I'm not a lawyer, many of you are, uh, but um, suffice to say that that was part of the argument. We also know that uh, in European museums are cultural artifacts from around the globe that were looted and brought to Europe by European um, archeologists and explorers and soldiers um, at different times. And that these artifacts continue to reside in European uh, museums, um, even though many of these nations are now have been petitioning and actually uh, in court fighting to have these things returned for decades. And the rationale for keeping them is that at the time that they were stolen, it was legal to have done so. So the doctrine of discovery continues to be the foundation for legal arguments for conducting, um, for nations conducting themselves in, cer in certain ways. Um, the last example, of course, uh, of the doctrine of discovery is the, this idea that skin color is not reasonable suspicion. That though, there was a time when um, the nationhood or even the personhood of an individual could be questioned by virtue of the color of their skin. Remember that when European explorers were going around the world in the 15th century, uh, laying claim to the world, they were encountering brown and black people. Okay. And so, um, the, the Dum Diversas and other, the doctrine of discovery gave Europeans the right to subjugate black and brown bodies. And so from that time till this, black and brown bodies have been in our culture targeted for surveillance and suspicion. <laughs> 
which is why we are so dramatically overrepresented in all of the random kinds of security checks that happen in street checks, traffic stops, in airports and the like. Now, there's one last slide perhaps that I'll show, maybe two. I, I uh, know that we want to have lots of time for, for, for discussion. But we have to think about racism's psychological effect on people. And we have been studying for a long time the psychological consequences of racism on people of color. We have noted that, uh, you know, uh, of course, Black people and other BIPOC folk have had a historical legacy of underprivilege. That means that we are more likely to be poor, that we have less access to financial resources than our white counterparts. We've talked about the intergenerational trauma that we've suffered. We've talked about the particular nature of racial trauma suffered by people of African descent. Um, I'm not going to talk about this here in this moment, but but uh, so we have some sense that um, the trauma, the reaction, uh, the pain, the suffering that these things are causing Black people. But in order to understand why white people cannot comprehend that and have not moved with greater speed to correct this, we need to understand racism's effect on white people. And this might be a little hard to hear in the two minutes that I'll dedicate to it, but that, that of course we understand that white people by virtue of the history in North America have this thing called white privilege, which is just the opposite of the historical legacy of underprivilege that black people have experienced. Not to say that all pe white people are wealthy, but white people who are more likely than their black counterparts at every stage of the socioeconomic spectrum to have advantages that their black counterparts do not have. There is this thing, however, called white supremacist acculturation that is very troubling. And all that is, is to say this, if your entire life and for hundreds of years, you have been told that your location in society is legitimate and superior, that your science and your philosophy, that your religion and your ideals are correct and superior, then you will carry with you that idea and it will shape your policies, your laws, your behavior, even your social practices in ways that you will not necessarily understand as racist or, um, or uh, discriminatory. So we, we understand this, for example, when we think about men and male socialization and how men come to understand that their opinion and their voice is legitimate in all spaces, even in spaces where, it, we, where the discourse is about women and women's bodies and their rights. Hence, we can see the, the abortion debate continuing, right? Because male people who wrote, wrote the laws um, and who carry the discourse are feeling license to render opinions on bodies that are not their own because they have been told they have the right to. History has told them that. We, this has resulted in, in phenomena that I won't describe here, white empathy, white guilt, white fear, white fragility, all things that, um, that are consistent with this idea. Finally, how do we combat all these things? This, uh, the, uh, well, it's with this idea of cultural competence. We need to, to work with an understanding that our cultural positions are different, that different peoples have different social cultural experiences and realities. So for example, it is illegitimate for a white person to say that traffic stops and street checks 
are a benign intervention in the lives of individuals who are racialized, unless they understand this history that I've shared with you and understand the nature of trauma and how it works and the nature and the history of racial trauma and how it works and how these stops are anything but a minor benign intrusion. And of course, we need to cultivate a proper attitudes and generate the capacity to communicate about these things and understand that stru structural oppression exists and to commit to eradicating them. So those would be my, my, my contributions as we, as we begin.